Now when Sambat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he said, That stone wall they are building, any fox going up on it will break it down. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their tongue back on their own herds and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have held insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. So we pray to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Amen. Amen. Eternal God, we thank you for your word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. It's time, Lord, for us to hear you speak to us. We have come as individuals, but we have also come as a community of faith. We have come with uncertainties and burdens. We have come with questions on our hearts and minds. And we pray that by the presence of your spirit, you will take your word and minister that word to your people. May your word minister to each one of us at the point of need. And we ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. My dear friends, as I said, although I'm talking about purposefulness, today I'm focusing very much on the enemies of your purpose. And when I talk about enemies of purpose, although some of the enemies can be external, they can also be internal. Your own choices in life your own, your own habits could serve as the enemy. So don't always think of enemy in terms of outsiders. If you have money and you are supposed to use the money for a particular purpose and you use the money for the wrong purpose, if you have time and you use the time for the wrong purpose, you will not be productive. So it's not every time that the enemies come from without. Sometimes they come from within. The Bible says a man's enemy shall be those of his own household. So sometimes they come from within. I have said to you before, you can bring a partner into your life, your wife, a husband, sometimes even your children can do things that derail your purpose in life. That's why we pray. We pray for those who are close to us so that they can make the right choices. You know, somebody who spent most of his working life abroad and he sent money to family to put up a home for him so that when he returns, he can have a place to live. The family decided that the money is always there. So rather than put up the house, we will use it to do party and, uh, and pay for funerals and things like that. Then to add insults to injury, they will take pictures of another person's house and take them to him. The man came home, there was no house. And I remember 
This is a true story I'm telling you. Remember when he came to see me, one of the things he said before he left, he said, I will never step to this country again. The enemies were people from within his own family. Reading the chapter 2, we concluded that there are important clues to purposefulness from which we ought to learn. For those of you who were here last week, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, the first part of verse 17, Nehemiah painted an accurate picture of the problem. He says, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates bent. So he knew the task that faced him and his people. And you can't solve the problem if you don't have a good perspective of it. If you don't know the enormity of the task, you can't marshal the required resources to deal with it. So you don't promise to help somebody when you don't know the problem. Because if your resources is just 100 cities, you don't go and tackle a 5,000 city problem. Nehemiah knew the problem. To be purposeful, we need an accurate picture of the issues that confront us. In the same text, Nehemiah 2.17, the second part, he interpreted the situation accurately. That's what the medical doctors will, will do. You have to be able to diagnose the problem. The fact that you know the problem doesn't mean that you can solve it. You have to do proper diagnosis of the problem. He saw the broken walls as a sign of shame for God's people. Because God is a God who does not destroy. God builds. He said to them, come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. It's a shame for us that we are not able to build the walls of the city that God has given us. So this was a call for collective action. When you go to the next verse, Nehemiah 2.18, the fact that the favor of the Lord was available was not lost on Nehemiah. And I have said, to be purposeful in life, you must stand in need of the favor of God. He says, the hand of the Lord has been gracious upon me. And the people were inspired. And so they responded positively. The people said, almost in a spontaneous way, let us start rebuilding. They shared the vision. Because the Hermel convinced them. During the watch night service here, the crossover service, I gave three indicators that shows that someone will be purposeful. Firstly, I said that a person must know what he or she is about. When you wake up in the morning, you have to be able to tell what this day is for. If you are not sure, adopt my style. Before I sleep, I have to write down the first thing I'm going to do in the morning after prayer. Because I don't want my agenda to be hijacked by other things that are not purpose for the day. You must know what you are about in every endeavor. Whatever you are doing, ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Secondly, purposeful people must be able to envisage the obstacles. Before you start the journey, you must know the obstacles that you are likely to encounter. And thirdly, I said, purposefulness will require passion. And you find that because the Hermia and the Israelites were passionate about what they were doing, they did not allow their detractors, their enemies, to destroy or spoil their agenda. When you are passionate about what you do, you pursue it with all the resources at your disposal because you believe in what you are doing. Today what I want to do is to examine with you some 
of the obstacles, the enemies to our purposefulness. We first encounter Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite and Geshem the Arab in Nehemiah 2.19. They had heard that the purposeful leader Nehemiah had mobilized the people to rebuild the broken walls of Jer Jerusalem. And Nehemiah says, when these enemies of God's agenda and progress heard about what was going on, they started to mock them. What is this that you are doing? They asked mockingly. Are you rebelling against the king? Nehemiah knew what he was about. In purposefulness, you must know what you are about. And Nehemiah knew what he was about. So instead of responding to the diversionary tactic, he replied with confidence in the God who had called him to lead the project. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 20. The God of heaven is the one who will give us success. And we his servants are going to start building. Hallelujah. And that's the text on which our theme is based. You can see it there in the corner. The God of heaven will give us success. And we, his servants, will start rebuilding. Now, this particular text in Nehemiah 2.20 adds something that we did not add to what is on the board. It concludes with the words, these people have no share or claim or right in Jerusalem. The people who started mocking them were people who had no interest in the project. So don't allow people who have nothing to lose to serve as a destruction to you. The people who mock your purposeful efforts are those who have nothing to lose when you fail. Most of the time they are only envious of your success, your seriousness, or envious of the fact that unlike them, you are purposeful. Mocking and ridiculing your efforts, that becomes their way of trying to either discourage you, run you down, or simply make you look irresponsible when you are not. It has never been easy not to respond to people like that because their attitude of mockery and ridicule sometimes can be very provocative. That's what the devil does. He provokes you. If you are the son of man, save yourself and save us. That's what Jesus was told. They were provoking him. When you get to that point, where you want to respond in frustration, I would like you to remember that self-control is a gift of the Spirit. When you read about the gift of the Spirit, self-control is one of them. So you can never sustain purposefulness if you do not learn to ignore certain types of distractions. If you want to be purposeful, certain distractions you must ignore. As a person of purpose, know what you are about. Know the obstacles that face you. And do what you want to do with the necessary passion. There are a number of ways in which Sanballat and the enemies of God's people attempted to discourage them in their purpose to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 2, Sanballat used the tactic of making the project look impossible. You tackle a task. You tackle something and you know that with faith in God and the right resources, you'll be able to accomplish it. Then people come along and let the project look out of proportion. Sometimes they will talk as if they mean well. 
But what they are actually trying to do is indirectly discourage you. So Sanballat deliberately painted a picture that made the destruction look as though it was be the, the destruction of the war to look as though it was beyond redemption. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? And burn ones at that up true. The, the heap of, of, of stones is all bent up. What are you going to be able to do out of this? You want to build a wall out of this that looks like dust? Describing the builders as feeble Jews seemed deliberate to portray the people who were committed to work as weaklings who were attempting to achieve great things. In Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 3, Tobiah, the accomplice to Sambalat, joined the mockery and let the project look unprofessional. So Sambalat made it look impossible. Tobiah wanted it to look unprofessional. That stone wall they are building, any fox going up on it will break it down. In other words, you have built it, but your efforts are in vain. Just a little wind will bring it down. He tried to suggest that a solid wall could not withstand any form of pressure. In other words, they tried to break the resolve of the people. Those who may attempt to break your resolve can be friends, family, competitors, sometimes co-workers, or anyone who does not have much interest in your purpose. And you've got to be aware and sensitive to those situations. That is what we discover someone so close to Jesus as Peter tried to do. When he took Jesus aside and tried to discourage him from going to Jerusalem. Jesus knew what he was about. He knew the devil could use people around him to discourage his project. And yet, because he was passionate about the cross. Remember that we call that week the Passion Week. That's where it comes from. He was so passionate about accomplishing that task of our salvation that he rebuked Peter, his closest lieutenant, get thee behind me, Satan. For what is in you is not the mind of God. It is the mind of man. It sounds like the mind of God, but it is not. Nehemiah knew, as we have said in previous sermons, that purposefulness begins with God. Amen. He responded to the detractors firmly and in no uncertain terms. Nehemiah 4, 4 to 5. Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. Turn their tongues back on their own heads. And give them over to plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt. And do not let their son be blotted out from your sight. For they have hurled insult in the face of the builders. The Hermia, as a purposeful leader, was angry. In fact, very angry at those who were mocking their effort. And asked God in prayer to deal with them. This is not a license for us to go around cursing those we think are working against us. Nehemiah was only demonstrating his frustration against those who refused to see the hand of God in the purposefulness with which they were doing their work. We find then that he does not concentrate all his attention on these enemies. Rather, in Nehemiah 4, 6, he says, so we rebuilt the wall and all the wall was joined together to have its height. And I like this part. It says, for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. That is what I refer to as developing the necessary passion for your purpose. 
compassion is the antidote to destruction. When you are passionate, you cannot be destructed. The enemy can be persistent, but we must remain resilient and anchor our faith in God. In Nehemiah 4, 7 to 8, when the mockery did not succeed in breaking the resolve of the Israelites, their enemies now attempted to use physical force to bring the work down. And Nehemiah met force with force. Nehemiah chapter 4, 7 to 8. But one Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Aftonites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the gaps were beginning to be closed. In other words, they saw the success that was coming. They were angry and all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion. What did Nehemiah do? Because this project was God's project, he went back to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Nehemiah 4, 9. So we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. This is what we call watch and pray. The first sermon on this series I refer to Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. On page 194, he writes, Problems force us to look to God and depend on Him instead of ourselves. Hallelujah. So Nehemiah, knowing that God is sovereign in these matters, especially that the project was God's own project, constantly prayed to God, not only to enable them to rebuild, but also to help them cope with the physical and verbal attacks of violence and aggression their enemies were doing against them. Nehemiah did not only resort to prayer, he also encouraged his people to prepare for battle. You got to have the sword by your side. And for Christians, we know that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. You got to arm yourself with that. This is what in the New Testament we refer to as watch and pray. He prayed, yes, but Nehemiah was also physically vigilant. So we pray to our God and then set a guard as a protection against them day and night so that when they show up, we can fight them and at least defend ourselves. My dear friends, you got to guard the things that are likely to bring you down. David failed because he refused to set a guard against his sexual drive. A king who was forced to commit adultery with somebody else's wife. In the end, he became a murderer. So don't look out there. Look within for those things that are likely to bring you down and to shame. Samson failed because he spent too much time with a woman he had no business spending time with, Delilah. In the end, that's how his enemies got him. There are places you don't have to spend time at. There are things you have to bring under control in your life. For some of you, it is your mouth. For others, it is your ears listening to every gossip in town. For some, it may be your eyes. Whatever it is, you have to guard them. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. That's what Peter says to the Christians. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. So Nehemiah resisted the opposition and you got to learn to resist those things that are a weakness. If the weakness comes through a friend, I have said to you, it is not everybody who should be your friend. If you think that person 
is a negative factor in your life, drop them. I'm not saying be at loggerheads. Greet them. But don't bring them to your company. How does one resist the devil? We resist the devil and devilish behavior by being alert to their schemes. So Nehemiah was alert. He prayed. But they also had their weapons on them. When Peter says, discipline yourselves and keep alert, he means there is a path that you can play in resisting those who attempt to discourage you from pursuing your dreams and purposes. Nehemiah prayed. But he also told his people to stay alert. I told you stories of young people who would come and talk to you and for some reason they have not been able to achieve their dreams in life. You probe into it and they have spent all their time in university preaching. Your, your, your parents did not take you to university to be a pastor. They took you there to go and study. You can attend fellowship and do God's work. But that's not the primary reason for being in school. So don't go to school and do 21 day fasting when you are supposed to study. Nehemiah prayed, but he also told his people to stay alert. The strength to do this, my dear friends, is found in Christ and in the power of his Holy Spirit. My prayer is that we may be empowered to resist the forces of darkness that seek to detract us from God's purposes. The fact that Nehemiah was purposeful, was a purposeful man, and the fact that his vision was given by God did not mean that everything was smooth. He was able to do what he did by keeping God at the center of it, constantly returning to prayer, maintaining a sense of discipline, and getting the people to prepare physically for any attack. He constantly returned to God for strength, because his purposes were directed by God. You cannot choose your own path in life and expect God to direct you when difficulties come your way. When you stubbornly insist on doing things your way, when problems come, you can't go to God and blame him for them. If the purposes are of God, he will supply the wisdom for its pursuit and execution and also the strength to cope in time of need. One of my friends had his name Kama in connection with the church office. He came to talk to me about what to do and how to approach it. I said to him, make sure that you never campaign for it. Because if you campaign for it, you will get it. You will be happy. But you will never see the hand of God in what you are doing. Because church office is not by campaign. It's a calling of God. Let me give the final word to Paul. Who as one of the most purposeful people of his day. Refer to how resistance, mockery and temptation. We're never going to break the resolve of people who belong to God. This is Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 11, and then verse 16. Paul says, But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power, that is the power with which we execute the purpose, this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. As Zachariah would say, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in our body the body of the, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal flesh. So we may be mortal, we may be weak, we may be vulnerable, but we can also demonstrate extraordinary strength because the Spirit of Christ is at work in us. Paul says, so we do not lose heart. 
even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. When we resist the devil and remain steadfast in faith, he flees from us and we rise up and do great and impossible things for God, such as rebuilding a wall that was broken with its walls bent. The restoration that comes from rebuilding that which looks like destroyed beyond repair is made possible by the Spirit of God, captain of Israel's host and guide. Of all who seek the land above, beneath thy shadow we abide, the cloud of thy protecting love. Our strength, thy grace, our rule, thy word, our end, the glory of the Lord. By thy unerring spirit led, in other words, the spirit of God never errs, by thy unerring spirit led, we shall not in the desert stray. We shall not for direction need, nor miss our providential way. We will never miss a purposeful way if God is the one who is in charge. As far from danger as from fear. While love, almighty love, is there. Let us pray. If it's going to happen, it's in your hands. If it's going to happen, it's in your hands. And what you do with the purposes of God for your life. So spend a few moments and ask God to seize control of that purpose. Spend a few moments and ask yourself, is my life being purposeful? Have I chosen friends? who will help me achieve my purpose? Am I spending my time in purposeful ways? Am I being true to the calling of God upon my life? So just pray about your own circumstance and your own situation. Pray that the God to whom the Hermia called will be the God to whom you call. And he says, you call me in the day of trouble and I will answer you. May he answer you. May he make you purposeful. May he give you victory over your enemies. May he surround you with his wall of fire. May God open your eyes and the eyes of your understanding that you may see those things that are likely to bring you down. And may he give you the strength to withstand those things. If there are any people around you who have become a problem and a headache and who seek to destroy you we commit them to God and pray that God himself will protect you against enemies, physical and spiritual, in your workplace, in your home, in your school, wherever you are. If there are any people who don't wish you well, we don't pray for people's destruction. We pray that God will change them and protect us against evil. So deliver us from evil, O God. Deliver us from evil. And let your purposes for our lives come to pass. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.